And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're ready to get back in our Father's Word. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Now, I want to tell you, this chapter parts, the latter parts of it are a little bit graphic, or it will be considered so by some people, be that as it may. We're just going to play it by ear here and see how we plow for a while, because we'll be talking some about agriculture, how you, to be a successful farmer, pleasing to God, whereby you receive his blessings. I don't know. It's up to you. It's amazing to me, and I'll insert a thought of my own, is that it is amazing to me that uh, man has um, changed livestock, that is to say hybrids and so on and so forth, down through the years. And we always come back to what God created in the beginning, basically works out best. I think that's kind of to his credit. Chapter 22, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father in Yeshua's name, and it reads, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or his sheep go astray, and hide thyself from them, thou shalt in any case bring them again unto thy brother. That, that means, that, and this means, this doesn't mean a blood brother necessarily in this case. It means a neighbor, all right, or someone in the community. You take care of each other. This is what, how you have good neighbors, is to be a good neighbor. You be a bad neighbor, I can guarantee you, you're going to have bad neighbors. It just works out that way. And a neighbor can be one of the most valuable people in your life because when you're away, he's going to look out for your property and uh, better than you could hire someone to do it. A good neighbor is just a priceless thing. You're, you care about other people's properties. It is too bad that uh, in... People that grew up during the Depression, even in pranks, if it came to destroying property, that wasn't fun. It should be that way yet to today. If you destroy property, it's still not fun. It's called waste and hurt and hard feelings. Verse 2, And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, if, if, if it's a, somebody that's way off, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it into thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. In other words, if, a, if an animal strays in, onto your property and you, it doesn't have a brand, it doesn't have a marking, and no one has reported one missing, then you can take that animal into your own herd this has to do with other things as well, something you find today. If you can't find the owner after you've made an attempt, well, then hold it for a while, and then if he does show up, well, then it is his, return it. But uh, likewise with an animal, when if the man came looking for it, you returned the animal. If not, it was kind of your animal. You were keeping it for him, however long it might be. Verse 3. In like manner shalt thou do with his eyes, and so shalt thou do with his raiment, and with all lost thing of thy brothers which he hath lost, and thou hast found, shall thou do likewise. Therefore mayest thou mayest not hide thyself. In other words, if you see he's lost something, don't turn your back on it. Pick it up and help him, return it to him. And do you know what happens? Do you know what the beauty of this is? He's going to do the same thing for you. That way you're both winners. Or you can do as some people and you're both losers. Where one, you know, trouble can be caused by many things. And um, I know in my many years experience in agriculture uh, of one animal getting out and destroying property on another man's, you know, if you've got a new corn crop, you kind of hate to have a herd of cattle from the neighbor march through your corn, taking some of the best. It just, it kind of sets up for hard feelings, and so neighbors should work together to keep a good fence up between them as well. Now, I, I know I'm using an analogy, I'll call it that, of agriculture, but that works in the city also. A good neighbor in the city is, is as valuable as one in the country. And uh, 
maybe even more so in this generation because uh, sometimes a neighbor can save the lives of your children or vice versa with things that happen in large cities to this day. Neighborhood watches are fantastic, and that's what this is teaching. God's Word teaches neighborhood watches, so to speak. Verse 4, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again. And so it is, if you pass by someone that is in trouble, stop and help them if it be possible. Now, I'm talking, there are, you have to use common sense. There are certain areas that certainly a woman should not stop and offer aid. But a man that is able to take care of his own self and, and um, assist a lady that obviously is in trouble, then do it. I heard a minister one time, a television minister, say, if any of the ladies of our church break down, I'll just wave at them as I go by and send someone else back to get them because I can't afford to be seen alone with a woman. Now, you know, that's almost perversive. Really, somebody's got a sick mind in a case like that. If, you know, if I was the pastor of a church and peaceful people gossiped and spread stories because... I stopped and helped some woman in need uh, by the roadside, I'd get rid of a bunch of uh, members right there. I'd make it so hot for them, they'd either shape up or they'd ship out. Now, I, I just don't, I don't understand how anyone could have perverted themselves in the opposite direction that they, you know, what could, th this is the way I look at this. If I passed a lady of our church that had a flat by the road and yeah, I'm going to be alone with her for an hour, big deal. She needs help. And anybody that would talk about a situation like that is sick in the head. All right? Help the lady. Otherwise, if you drive on and send back help, a wicked person might come by and rape her and kill her while you were gone. Then what do you do? This... Um, I believe we have in the United States of America and most states, if not all, I believe it's all states, the Good Samaritan Law, which means you are covered under the Good Samaritan Law if you see someone bleeding to death. You can try to stop the bleeding and you can't be sued for it. Uh, like I say, now I'm, I'm not sure that that still stands in every state, but I know it is in most states. And I think, to, I feel that the Good Samaritan law stems from this very law. And it's a good law. It was of old time, and it still is to this time. Thank God for horse sense, for common sense. A person must always use common sense. Now, I have been in places, when I was going to flight school at one place or the other, that I almost fell into a trap when a young lady... Uh, tried to flag me down for help, and I could see in the dark shadows about 10 men. Uh, it was a setup. So you've got to use good judgment. Na needless to say, this country boy, when he saw the bats and the clubs, uh, the, my rented car uh, hit uh, overdrive, and I was long gone. But, so you've got to be careful when you're in a different environment than your own, whereby you know what's going down, all right? Uh, don't let the good Samaritan law cause your death, all right? Good enough said. Verse 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. This is probably one of the most misused scriptures in God's word. I mean, there are some churches that will not allow a woman in the church if she's wearing a pantsuit. Got to have us. Biblical says it right there in the Bible. Well, the manuscripts are very clear on this also. What it means is it has a sexual connotation. It is a repeat, or I should more correctly say that Romans chapter 1 is a repeat of this Deuteronomy 22.5. What it means is that a woman will not put on the man's part in a sexual act with a woman. 
Neither shall a man take on the sexual uh, role of a woman uh, with a man, working that that is unseemly and that that is perverted and that is, that is not natural. God just won't tolerate it. From it comes disease and you name it, uh, trouble, trouble, trouble. And that's what it talks about. It has nothing to do. A pantsuit is not man's clothing. If one, if one of these preachers thinks that a pantsuit is man's clothing, let him, let him try to put one on sometime. He'll find out that it's cut a little different than his britches are, that it's women's clothing. And maybe get a little bit of an education before you start trying to preach God's Word. That way you won't mislead people and make a fool out of yourself. And my, I'll never forget, one of my little daughter-in-laws was criticized for going into a church with a friend. I told her, I said, kick the dust off your feet and don't ever go back to the place. I would say that to all of you. Stay out of houses that are so perverted in their minds over uh, what should be and should not be. Now, here's the hammer, all right? If a... If we were to hold this verse for the way they translate it, that it actually has to do with a garment, a woman would not be allowed to wear a dress, a skirt. Do you know why? Because, my dear friend, at the time of this writing, men wore skirts. So just put that in your little old pulpit uh, recess there and sit on it a while. But stop misleading and misteaching God's Word, misleading the people and feeding them poison rather than getting to the truth whereby perversion leaves your church. I know that upsets some and I never, if somebody has something that happens to them a certain way, well keep it to yourself. Don't put it in front of me. I don't want to see it. It upsets me. If you're perverted, keep your own perversion. We can still you can still be a servant of God if you ever see the light. But I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear about it. And you had better, for the sake of your safety, bring it forth in front of me and my grandchildren. Period. Verse 6. If a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way, in any tree or on the ground, whether they be young ones or eggs, meaning they're not hatched out yet, and the dame sitting upon the young or upon the eggs, thou shalt not take the dame with the young. Now, naturally, it was common if for wild poultry, some of the nests, the eggs were taken, and they had eggs. You know, but you, they naturally, a, a wise person knows when uh, eggs are passed up. But what I want you to see here, this has to do with the scripture we studied in an earlier lecture that has to do with never see the kid in the mother's milk. It shows the compassion of God for his animal kingdom. And it was important that, um, that the, the uh, animals be protected as well. In other words, being too destructive, you take away your food supply. But we see God's love and respect for even his animal kingdom. And then some people wonder if there will be animals in heaven. There was in the first earth age, there is in this earth age, and certainly Isaiah chapter 11 documents that there will be in heaven as well. Verse 7, But thou shalt in any wise let the dame go and take the young to thee that it may be well with thee and that thou mayest prolong thy days. That's if you're having to destroy a piece of ground, that is to say plow it as far as natural habitat goes. Take care of the wildlife that is there. Eight, when thou buildest a new house, then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof that Thou bring not blood upon thine house if any man fall from thence. In other words, a great deal of time was spent on the roof, both as watchmen and as well as it was uh, in the evening, it was a cool place to be. And all it's doing is it's saying, 
build you about a three foot fence around the roof or something so somebody won't fall over, fall off. It's kind of like God was a building inspector or advisor to build safely even to this time. And you should always use common sense in what you build and see that it is safe for humanity, for God's children. I would say again, this documents naturally, if anyone had a question. God loves his children and he loves them to be protected, safely uh, abiding and living without having dangerous things that can hurt. So, and that's basically what that says. When you build something, build it right. Don't build it where it comes crashing down on a bunch of, uh, of uh, people's heads. Safety precaution. God taught it. Verse 9. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers seeds. Divers means different. Lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Now, uh, many of you may not be many uh, gardeners or, or what have you, but certain pollens will cross, and you're going to get a sorry uh, group of fruit. If, if you want to really experience this, sometimes plant a row of cantaloupe and, and a row of cucumbers right side by side. I should say hills for the farmers, but you know what I'm talking about. We are talking to people, some that have never turned a spade of dirt. So. But I guarantee you, you're not going to get, when you harvest, you're not going to get cucumbers and you're not going to get cantaloupes. You're going to get cupolopes and you're going to get lopacupes. And they're not very good, I guarantee you. Uh, they're very tasty. Well, how do I know that? Well, big old dummy me, I one time inadvertently planted a new type melon too close to my cucumbers and, and it ruined my cucumbers and it ruined my new cantaloupes, all right? It happens, just don't do it. God, I want you to remember this. God created things the way he wants them. And any time you change God's natural way, you perverted it. And God doesn't like it. God doesn't like you mixing things up. That's what he's talking about. Don't try to mix your cantaloupes and your cucumbers. It won't work. God created cucumbers the way he wanted, and he created cantaloupes the way he wanted them. Leave them alone that way. He said, don't do it. Well, uh, I didn't know God taught us how to farm. Where do you think knowledge comes from? All wisdom comes from God, all right? Okay, um, that's why you be careful how you plant your crops. There, there are, there's more than one place that this is mentioned, and in other places it goes into more detail, but we'll let that suffice for the time. Verse 10, Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together, now, these are kind of personal laws now. Um, I'm, you know, I uh, was fortunate or unfortunate enough, I don't know, I guess it would be according to who was looking at it, I consider it fortunate, that I've worked teams in my lifetime quite a, quite a bit, quite a bit. I never liked to see a mule and a horse set up as a team. That is ugly, ugly just doesn't look right. But I'll take a good pair of mules, which are actually hybrids. That's where man is messed around, any way you want to go about it. Uh, a jackass and a mare will not cross unless they're forced to, all right? So be that as it may, man does it, forces them to, and there you got the mule. But anyway, God doesn't like that. So what he's saying here, don't mix things up. I've got them the way I want them, get a team. If you're going to use ox, use ox. If you're going to use mules or, or uh, asses, use them, but don't mix them up. Boy, that law has been broken many a time. Verse 11. Thou shalt not wear a garment of diverse sorts. That means different things. As of woolen and linen together. 
Now, I probably should share with you that this is personal law. So it has to do with person as much as it does what you're wearing. And it doesn't really, he's not really talking about clothing here. You can take it that way if you want to. Boy, have we, with all the synthetic fibers that we've come out with, have we broken this law? If that were to be the case, it just so happens that's not what he's talking about. And in the beginning of the next chapter, and I doubt if we get there today, but we might, he's talking about people as well. You need to do a great deal of work on the word adultery. It doesn't mean only what some people take it to mean. Adultery means mixing. He doesn't like it. He has things the way he wants it. Verse 12. Thou shalt make thee fringes upon the four corners of thy vesture wherewith thou coverest thyself. Now, what this was, many might say, well, what does that mean? Well, back in Numbers, the 15th chapter, you'll find out that he gave these personal laws, and then he said, you make these little fringes, and every time you see one of them, let that remind you of the Word of God. And many people would say, oh, my word, did they really do that? Well, what about today when they now put a string on your fingers so you'll remember? It's the same thing, all right? Uh, basically, same thought. I guarantee you, if you study God's Word the way you should, you're not going to need a string on your finger. I'm not going to let you in the first place. I'm going to keep reminding you over and over about God's law. But you yourself, once you taste the good fruit of God's Word, you're not going to be able to stop yourself, and you're going to remember it. So, as far as I'm concerned, in Christ, you can nail that one to the cross with Him because with Christ, you better not forget the Word of God. Better not. You don't need tassels to remind you. Now, every time you see a tassel from here out, let it say, well, that's to remind me of God's Word. That's why they made tassels. Well, you'd be exactly correct. Again, your numbers, 15, chapter, chapter 15, verse 38 will document that. Verse 13, if any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her, uh, 14, and give occasions of speech against her, bad mouths her, and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I found her not a maid. Wasn't a virgin, all right? Now, I feel I should not, uh, it's not necessary to cover these verses, and I may skip at any time. Because basically, this law is not in effect any longer. Basically, in Christ, we have to forgive all sins, and all sins are forgiven. You can't have it whereby Christ can forgive some sins and not all. There's only one sin that he will not forgive, and of course, that is the unforgivable sins. So, if a Christian slip and sin, we must forgive them. Why? Because you expect they to forgive you. And most of all, we expect and know Christ will forgive us and we become a new creature. I just wanted to insert that to let you know this was old law that blood ordinances were done away with on the cross, and in a sense, this will ultimately turn into a blood ordinance because blood will decide. 15, this will be a little graphic. If you um, are a little sensitive to it, then it's time for you to take a break right now. 15, then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the city in the gate, 16, and the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. They're not getting along at all. 17. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her. He's gossiped, mean-mouthed, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. And the elders of the city shall take that man and chastise him, 
19, and they shall, um, Amherst, that means they're going to find him. They're going to take money out of his pocket. That's what immerse means. They're going to find him. In a, a, a hundred shekels of silver and give them unto the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name unto a virgin of Israel and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. 20. Uh, I think I'll, I, well, we'll, well I, I'm going to go ahead and teach it, though it doesn't apply. Because uh, thank God, now that Christ has um, paid the price, that is to say, brought forth forgiveness for us, whether it be the damsel or the man, that on repentance they can change. But... Um, I guess what I'm trying to say, I can't visualize a woman wanting to stay with a dude like that anyway, quite frankly. Uh, she has biblical reason under the law to get rid of him, all right? Verse 20, I know that may upset some people, but that's the law, my friend, and it's kind of common sense, too. A woman should never stay with somebody that hates her. Life is too short and too precious and inasmuch as forgiveness comes forth, it's too easy to start over anew. And I guarantee you, I hate divorce. I hate it with a passion. Verse 20. It's, I mean, it's a sad, sad situation. It's as bad as a death in a family. Verse 20. But if this thing be true and the tokens of virginity be not found for the damsel, 21, then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of the father's house and the men of the, her city shall stone her with stones that she die. Because I don't, I truly do not believe this happened very often. And it's part of the law that uh, I feel that false witnesses, well, I'll, I'll finish this and I'll make a statement. Because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away from among you. Many might have thought it very unusual that God would insist that a false witness be stoned to death. Well, if a false witness accused this woman of doing wrong and it meant her death, then the penalty is the same for the one that brought the false witness. Now, thank God that we have forgiveness for I think most Christians want to forgive those things that it is lawful to forgive. Let it strengthen your love for Christ when you read this to know he fixed this whereby it is so wonderful and love overcomes tremendous burdens. 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. 23. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, that's like engaged, okay? And a man find her in the city and lie with her, 24, then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. God was pretty severe. Thank God we have repentance and forgiveness. Now there are certain cases, and verse 25 brings up one of these cases, that does not operate under the law of forgiveness here on earth in this earth age. So it kind of puts it in a different category, and the sin happens to be rape. You're going to learn here what is supposed to happen to a rapist from God's law. And this is why I speak so strongly against a rapist. Verse 25. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her, I repeat, force her, that's take strong hold of her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall 
die. Now that law hasn't changed. 26. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. I repeat, shall do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. In other words, rape suffers the same penalty as murder. And don't ever forget that. I'll say it again. And a murderer cannot, I repeat, this is why forgiveness doesn't work in this case, that a man that... Uh, is a murderer cannot have salvation or eternal life in his soul while he's still in the flesh body. Why? Because God demands that he die, that capital punishment be exercised. Why? So that the man's soul is returned to the Father, whereby the one he murdered is waiting for him there. And they're going to work things out. He's going to have a hot old time of it because he's going to have quite a party waiting for him when he gets there. I talk about repentance and talk about an old-timey prayer meeting begin to take effect by a murderer. I'd say that was time to let her fly, but you better mean it from your heart because God knows what you think. You can't con him. So, my friends, rape carries the same penalty as a slayer that is to say, someone that commits a criminal homicide and therefore cannot be forgiven in the flesh but must be dispatched to the Father. God demands the death penalty for forcible rape, period. 27. For he found her in the field, and the betrothed damsel cried, and there was none to save her. So he gets the capital punishment. That is God's law, and it has not changed. If you think, in as much as he says rape is the same as a criminal homicide, if you think that repentance will bring you salvation in the name of Christ, you'd better read the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15. For a murderer, a manslayer, cannot have eternal life in his soul as long as he's in this, on this earth in the flesh. Sorry, you'll have to wait. You got, a, you got some tall explaining to do by the chief judge himself, our Father. All right, bless your hearts. We'll pick this law up again in the next lecture. Hey, these laws are important to this day. It will help you understand the emotions of our Father and how he feels about certain things. I think that keeps one out of a lot of trouble when you analyze it, meditate on it, and accept it. All right, bless your heart, you listen a moment.